Hi guys, I'm EBM and welcome to Los Angeles. The Blue Oval flown me out here a few days ago to have a good look at their new full electric SUV, the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Now, if you're wondering why I'm in a hotel room instead of stood next to the car itself telling you all this, it's because of the uh, rules and embargoes that we've been given by Ford so we couldn't actually film with the car until later on tonight at the reveal venue. Time and circumstance have forced me to do this video here, but I will be doing another one at the reveal venue itself with the car itself. Uh, so if you want to watch just basically a, a brief overview, that's what that video will be about. This one is very much a, a deep dive into every piece of information I have got from Ford, every, everything basically I have discovered over the last few days after poking around in the Ford Mustang Mach-E. The one thing I will say that if you're looking at a Tesla Model 3 right now, and now the Mustang Mach-E, honestly, I'd be doing this. Ooh, uh, ooh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I really don't know which one is best right now. And that is probably the biggest compliment you can pay to any electric vehicle at the moment, because whether you like it or not, Tesla are the benchmark. Right, let's get on with the specs of this car. Time is against me, I'm afraid, so I'm gonna to have to kind of plow through this one. The car itself comes in four different variants, rear wheel drive and all wheel drive versions of both battery sizes. So you have a 75 kilowatt hour battery with rear wheel drive and all wheel drive, and a 99 kilowatt hour battery with rear wheel drive and all wheel drive. Now the rear wheel drive options, the 75 comes with a range of 280 miles, according to Ford, on the WLTP scale. So I'd probably go for about 230 to 240 in the real world for that. If you have the 99, the bigger battery version, in, in real wheel drive only, then you will have an expected range at least of 370 miles on Ford's WLTP scale. I would probably go for 310 to 20 miles of real wheel range for the 99 kilowatt hour battery. Now, if you go for the all-wheel drive option, your range goes down a little bit. It's 260 miles for the 75 kilowatt hour battery and 335 on the 99. So obviously you lose a bit of range because you've got four-wheel drive and of course more power. There are three different power outputs. The 75 with rear-wheel drive comes with 258 PS. The 99 in rear-wheel drive comes with 285 PS. PS and if you go to the all-wheel drive option obviously it's going to be a quicker car which is why the range drops then you're going to have 258 PS for the 75 version and the effectively top spec all-wheel drive 99 kilowatt hour version comes with 337 PS. There will also be a launch edition or first edition as Ford are calling it which you'll be able to pre-order tonight after the reveal venue as it seems uh, and that will be based on the 99 kilowatt hour all-wheel drive. Now on to price, which most people, of course, will be bothered about. It will be launched in America first, and then we'll go into Europe quite soon afterwards. Uh, initially, it'll be just UK, Norway, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. And I do have UK prices. This is a UK channel, of course. I will put the other countries' prices in the description below, so if you're not in the UK, then have a look at that one. But basically, the 75 kilowatt hour rear-wheel drive version, the, the entry level, as it were, will start at £40,270. Now, this seems a little odd to me because that is just above the luxury car tax bracket. Um, but I, I am going to have a word with a few people at Ford later on today and say, well, hang on a minute, just knock it down by £270 and you don't have to make your customers pay £375 a year for five years in luxury car tax. You know, it, it makes sense to do that. Now, the first edition, the launch version, will be £58,000. That is, of course, the 99 kilowatt hour all-wheel drive, fully specced car. So we're looking at a price of 40 to 58,000 pounds in the UK for the Mac E. Now, of course, the time, when, when, when is it coming out? Well, there'll be six models effectively in Europe once they're finished. The rear wheel drive, which comes in two battery versions, will be out in early 2021. The all wheel drive, again, in two battery sizes, will be available in late 2020. This is in Europe, remember. And the first edition will also be available in late 2020. The GT, which is a higher performance version, again, I will come to that, uh, comes out in 2021 as well. 
There are eight colours at launch, one of which is unique to the first edition and won't be done again, so that will be quite exclusive. Uh, two technology packs will be available in terms of optional extras, and the warranty on the battery is eight years or 100,000 miles. Top speed of the car is about 110 miles per hour or 180 kilometers, and we'll put all the curb weight, the length, the width, and the height in the description below if you want to know, th know those in detail. At this stage, I will say that um, free bars are a very bad idea which is why I'm kind of stumbling over my words in this uh, this video. <laughs> I'll also put in the description below the colours available, including, of course, the first edition exclusive colour. Now, the technology pack. The first one basically gives you a 10-speaker b &O sound system. You've got hands-free tailgate, traffic sign recognition, advanced active park with camera and active drive assist with lane centering. The technology pack plus, which basically comes with all the ones I've just mentioned, and eight-way power memory front seats, perforated Sensico premium fuel comfort seats with coloured stitching, power foldable door mirrors with puddle lights and a full length panorama roof, which is actually quite nice, but it is an optional extra. All cars will come with what I'm about to mention now, a 15 and a half inch touch screen and a 10.2 inch full digital uh, instrument cluster, if you like the dashboard binnacle display. Uh, one pedal drive will be available, which will be similar to the one in the Nissan Leaf, if you're familiar with that one. Uh, and you will also get a front trunk, you can use your phone as a key, uh, key fob entry and ignition, of course. There are the, 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 these the buttons as well on the doors, which basically prop it open and then you can open it that way. So there's no handles as such, it's just like a little button which makes the door pop open. And crucially, like Tesla again, which I will probably be comparing it to quite a lot, because it, it, again, it's the benchmark, uh, you can get over the air updates. So the car will get firmware or software upgrades throughout its life which is, for me, how every car should be from this point on. They're effectively a piece of technology in some parts of cars now, and this is something which I think is should be standard almost now, very soon, if not now, for any car. There is something called a Ford Pass Connect, which basically, similar to the Mercedes EQC, you'll be able to plug into something like an Ionity network around Europe, and it will automatically bill you. You won't have to get a different app or a different RFID card to access the charge point. You will just do it through the car kind of plug and play basically. It comes with the Ford Sync 4 with sat nav and voice control, which I haven't had to test, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but you do get wireless Android and uh, Apple CarPlay, which is good. So they've really loaded this thing with new technology. Of course, you'll have the usual stuff, adaptive cruise control, uh, speed sign recognition, lane centering, auto high beam, blind spot information, cross traffic alert with active braking, driver alert, evasive steering assist, glare free high beam, not sure what that is. Intelligent speed limiter, lane keeping, post collision braking. Post collision braking? Well, I guess. <laughs> All right. You also get a rear view camera and reverse brake assist and parking aids. There's a wireless charging pad as well at the front of the car uh, and a hands free tailgate. So you can basically shut it without having to use hands because, you know, that's that's. That's the first world problem, is that. You get 18 inch wheels uh, or 90 on the all wheel drive, and of course the GT will have bigger wheels and wider wheels. Uh, again, I'll come to that specifically in a bit. The charging, it will charge up to 150 kilowatts on uh, a charger that supports it, of course. So that's that, I would say that's about average by today's standards, and I think it's pretty much enough on cars with this range, certainly in Europe anyway. Ford are part of the Ionity group, so of course it will come with CCS in Europe. Oh, and actually, one thing that is very important, I haven't mentioned, this is a proper ground-up electric vehicle. It is not a modified petrol car. The vast majority of technology in this, from the motors, the batteries themselves, which come from LG Chem, this is all Ford's development stuff. If you look right at the bottom, near the front splitter, below where the grille would be, you can see louvers that open up and obviously change the airflow. Now this has been developed quite quickly. I think it's just over a year from concept. It was originally going to be a concept car apparently, and then very quickly they realized, no, 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 we want to do this properly. Uh, most cars that people really like, things like the original Golf GTI, they were all developed in-house by a small group of people, enthusiasts, and Ford have basically done a similar thing with it. They've kept it very small. So you, don't, you, know, you can't design a car by committee, can you? Now, noise, this is something unfortunately I can't show you because we weren't allowed to film it, but when you're in uh, sports mode or unbridled mode, you know, because it's a horse, uh, when you're in sports mode, it um, gives you a sound which is linked to the pedal. And the best way of describing it is, it's like a, a cross between a V8 engine and an electric whine. It sounds really bizarre and like it shouldn't work, but it actually really did. I won't try and do it like a 
you're not going to get the idea from that one. That, that, that was a terrible idea. But, but basically, I, I liked that. I thought, you know what? The one thing I've always thought is what a, what a car maker's going to do with the noise. Jaguar have their, their take on it. Some of them just don't do a noise, but that I quite like. And of course, you can turn it off. You don't have to have it. Um, but it gives you a, a sense of when you accelerate, you, you've got a bit of extra noise there. So it helps the driver with you know that kind of subconscious feeling. You don't have to look at the speedometer to know what you're doing. The boot, I would say, is probably similar to the I-Pace in terms of size and uh, usability. And you can fold the seats down, which pretty much go flat. So you've got a pretty practical load bay there. Now the rear, clearly, again, inspired by Mustang, you've got the kind of three lights on either side. It's got a bit of an I-Pace kind of slant to it, that kind of coupe-ish look. But again, it does look better in, in the flesh. It's not the best looking car in the world. I always say this, SUVs will never be a good looking car uh, for me because I prefer a, you know, a traditional car as opposed to an SUV. But as, as, as SUVs go, I think this is one of the better looking ones. Now, the GT performance version. This clearly is going to be a quicker car. It's more aggressive, slightly lower, slightly stiffer. It, it's not fully finished yet, so we don't know the full specs, but it'll do not 16 roughly under, I think it's three and a half seconds-ish, I think they said. Of course, subject to change, they're still finishing it off. We're still in kind of late pre-production with all the cars I'm showing you here. Main difference is uh, the front. You get a more aggressive splitter, a more aggressive bumper, which for me does look better. You also get the different coloured grille, which I kind of prefer because it gives people that traditional car look at the moment. It's got a grille there, but it's not a grille, but it's not body coloured. So it, it, it splits the front of the car up. So for me, that is the best looking version of this. But the other one's not too bad either, the standard version. At the end of the day, whether you think it's good looking or not, only you can decide. It doesn't matter if I think it's good looking, every person's different. So cosmetics don't really change anything. It's different from person to person. So let me know in the comments what you think. Do you think this is a good looking car? Bear in mind it's an SUV. You know, It's not trying to compete with a Ferrari or anything. Um, I, I, I like it and it does look better, again, in the flesh. Now let's get on to the interior, because this one, no doubt, people will be screaming as soon as they see it. The pro obviously, I've already shown you it. Uh, oh, they've copied Tesla. They've put a massive, massive screen in the middle. And you know what? I don't know if they have. They said, look, we designed that because it was the best thing we thought for, for, for our customers. We didn't copy anybody. If it just happens to be the same as someone else, then is that a bad thing? If that's a good idea, it's a good idea. I personally prefer physical buttons to a big touch screen. There is one thing which this start, this does have over something like the Tesla big information displays. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a black ring. That's a physical turning you know, knob. It's not just a, a picture of a button. You can actually turn that and it's within the display. So for example, if you wanted to uh, change the volume uh, of the music you're listening to, you don't have to take your eyes off the road. As you can see there, of course, uh, next to the steering wheel, you've got an actual dashboard binnacle display. That is something which a lot of people, not a lot of people, I think quite a few people who have not driven one don't like about the Model 3, the fact that it's just one display and there's nothing in front of you. The grey kind of felt bits you can see that cover the dashboard display and to the right there where it's just a big kind of long fabric part, I'm not sure what they describe it, they are speakers. We've had a good look in the show cars, but they are still effectively at pre-production levels. So there's no point in me telling you about what the build quality is like because I can't be truthful on that because it's not finished yet. Good room in the rear, um, decent headroom, although I'm not the tallest person in the world, but I think if you're, if you, you know, six foot four or five, you may find it a little bit tight in the rear. Uh, however, one thing I will say, it, similar to the I-Pace, again, you kind of have to climb into the rear rather than just, you know, just slide or get into it. And of course, the frunk, which as I mentioned earlier, has the plug at the bottom, so you can just stick anything liquid in there, ice in there, something dirty in there, and then wash it down. I think it'll be quite popular with the mob because you can stick a body in there and just rinse it down afterwards. Right, well, that's pretty much it, guys. I will look forward to the reveal later on and we'll be putting that video up later, which will be more of a, an event thing. And I'll give you the basic specs again in that video. If you're wondering why there are two of basically the same car, it's just how this entire few days has worked out. I am doing this where I am due to necessity rather than anything else. And I promise you, hand on heart, I am not saying that I like this car as much as I do because Ford have flown me out to, to LA. I promise you I have not done that. If it wasn't a good car, I would be telling you now. But I think this is a genuine, credible alternative to the Tesla Model 3. Finally, someone's put some thought into an electric car. I'm sick of manufacturers making things like the, uh, the Mercedes EQC. It's basically a compromised petrol adaptation. You know, it's got a massive transmission tunnel in the bottom, 
and no transmission in there because it's an adapted petrol car. That does my head in. This is a proper ground up EV. The Model Y is a better comparison to the Mustang Mach-E rather than the Model 3, but that's not out yet. So of course we don't have anything to compare it against. I for one, uh, I'm glad that the Blue Oval has finally, Ford have finally caught up with the rest of the manufacturers. They've been lagging behind in not just full electric cars, but electrification of the whole range. So they're kind of playing a little bit catch up here, which is probably why they've, they've gone full on on this. But for a first proper full battery electric vehicle, I'm not counting the Focus Electric, for the first proper one, this is an immensely good attempt. It really is. So again, please do hammer the comment section. Let me know what you think. And if you haven't, subscribe to the channel. Over 80% of the people that watch my videos aren't subscribed. It really does make a difference. I wouldn't be in downtown LA right now if people didn't subscribe to this channel. So please, please, because I want more free holidays, subscribe to the channel, please. Seriously though, guys, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please do watch the reveal event that will be going up in, in, in half a day or so, um, and I will see you soon.